words. Welcome. Thank you, Magnus, and thank you for inviting me here. Yo. It was, um, it was uh, really, I, mean, I, I love closure. So if I come up a bit out a bit uh, religious about the thing, uh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, actually, as, <laughs> uh, yeah, because closure quite literally changed my life yep. for the better. So it's, uh, it's, I love this opportunity to uh, to stay here, stay here, tell people about it. So uh, who am I? I'm Peter Strömberg. I also listen to the name Pez. And uh, uh, for what I do when I want to have fun is spend time with my family and also code. So those two things. Uh, maybe most fun there is spending time with my, f with my wife because she's very fun. <laughs> she makes me laugh all the time. And then at daytime, I am a mobile app developer using these tools that I'm going to show you today. And um, we're trying to improve people's health uh, using technology at Piloxa. So today's uh, tool uh, here will be, of course, be closure, closure script, and how that uh, is brought into Visual Studio Code by a tool that I have made called Calva. So let's uh, let's begin with uh, a bit about closure then. So this. Uh, talk has to name the word ergonomics in it and that's that's actually what has struck me with this with this language the way I found it was that I was uh, at a at a fintech startup and where the devs brought in uh, closure it was a greenfield uh, project and the devs brought in closure and I could see how they had this immediate feedback while they were working. So I got very, very interested in, in, in it, and I also wanted to do it. And since it was full stack, and they let me play a bit with it on the closure script front end of, of things. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how it started. And then I realized that I, I, need, to, I need to become a closure programmer myself and, and have that as my work, because then that would make work perfectly fun for me. So, closure, it's a Lisp, uh, and as we heard before, Lisp could be at this academic end of things, but closure is not really. It's found, founded, founded like on papers and all these great ideas that come from the universities and stuff like that, but it's a very practical and pragmatic uh, language. You can use it in the industry for about anything, I would say. And it's made practical, practical by this idea that it should be easy to make things simple. And yeah, so, so I would say closure is there. It, at least it makes it very much easier. There is still pain to be pain, paid for the gain, but it's certainly easier. The big thing about it, and that what I will focus on today, is interactive programming. I will speak a bit more about that what it means, uh, uh, but that is the big thing, uh, at least as I see it. Closure is a hosted language. It started on the JVM, uh, but it also exists on the JavaScript VM as, in, as Closure Script, and it also there is also one uh, closure for for the CLR, and uh, even for the Erlang VM, you have uh, Closure if you like. The uh, thing about Clojure is that it's functional, functional first. It's not, maybe not pure as uh, Haskell or something like that, but it's definitely functional first. And it's also immutable by default. It, things are immutable, so you can trust that they won't change on your feet. But you can also easily mutate things in a thread safe way. Uh, and this immutability gives us value semantics. You can compare even complex 
uh, data with each other. And if they contain the same thing, you will have equality. It's, uh, that's very powerful. And it also has very rich uh, uh, literal data types. Uh, and this together, I would say, makes closure more data oriented than most things you have seen before. It's uh, when you work with the closure, you work like often from, from the bottom and up. You don't design so much from the top and finding out relationships and stuff like that. Uh, instead, you, you, you actually create a data structure from, from, from the bottom. So one of the eye openers for, for me was that looking at my colleagues at this fintech, when they worked, they so often just hammered out uh, an example data structure in, in the REPL and started to talk about it and uh, started to transform it. And, uh, and that looked to me very interesting. And the next time I really uh, was uh, struck by this was at Piloxa, where the Niklas, my colleague who, he, who recruited me, we were going to remodel a thing, a uh, central thing in the app. And he sat for a few hours at his desk, and then they asked me to come over. And on his computer, that was a data structure with examples. And I was a bit confused by this, because I think it was like an architectural session we had. But it actually was. So from that data structure, we could, he asked me, Peter, does this make sense? And I looked at the data, and some of them, uh, things I immediately saw, we could probably need to tweak, and then, but we still have that data structure in the system uh, today. So it's uh, very much built from, from the bottom up. Speaking about ergonomics then, uh, this nil safety, I think, is a big thing. In nil is the closure null thing. But unlike in many other systems, where null is the value of death, you should be really scared if you get null somewhere, because if you call something on null, everything will blow up. That's not the, the, the thing in what's happened in closure. Most functions, they accept nil as a friend. So, uh, so you, you can... You, you can let nil happen. And the functions you use and the functions you should create do something sensible with it. It's also very strong abstractions. It's very much built from abstractions. And I highlight the sequence abstraction, which I think is, uh, is uh, like central in, in, in closure. So you get every, almost everything you work on can be treated as a sequence. It has three functions you can call on it. And so, so you can, yeah, and, and with this abstraction, you, you, you build most things in Clojure, I would say. It has very uh, uh, rich standard library. Uh, it has, I would say, just the right things in, in, in the core library. So you don't need to bring in very much else just uh, to do a lot of the things. But then also, the, these, uh, this standard library is very stable. And Clojure is very stable. So I think like if you wrote a Clojure program on the first version of Clojure back in 2008, I don't, some, somewhere around there, that program still runs on the latest Clojure. Um, <coughs> and it, it usually said that it grows by libraries. So this, this uh, core library, it, it stays there and stable, and then, it, uh, then the community and the people creating, creating closure, they create libraries to extend it. And all those libraries also have this cultural, culture of keeping things stable. It's very common that you come to GitHub for, for, from, for a library uh, you're interested in, and you see the last commit was two years ago. For some, some, in some uh, ecosystems, that, that means stay away from this. It's not maintained anymore. In Clojure, it often means it is done. So in Clojure, a lot of the libraries reach a done state, which I think is very, very powerful. Another thing with, with the 
closure is, because it is a lisp, it is, I will try to say this word, it has homo-iconicity. Yeah. <laughs> it, it basically means that closure itself is expressed in the same way that the data is expressed. So closure code is data. And that means that you can, that you can use all of closure to modify closure code. And if you remember Max uh, <coughs> uh, Nordlund, I think was his name, uh, speaking here a month ago, something about, about um, metaprogramming with, with, with uh, Erlang, he told you that in C, for instance, also has macros, uh, but it's like on the text level. And in Erlang, Max told us that it's like on the token level. In Clojure, it's on the full syntax level, since Clojure code is also Clojure data and vice versa. And this drives this, that Clojure can grow with the libraries. So some, some of the Closure libraries that, that you use are they're very like they look like they belong in closure, uh, but they are actually just done with macros. So that it's, it's very powerful. And also this uh, that code is data and uh, it has structure. I think you, maybe you can compare it to XML. Maybe it's not as verbose as XML, of course, but that's, that's a structural language. Uh, and since you have this structure, it also enables structural editing, something that uh, uh, closure uh, IDs and editors uh, will take uh, full advantage of. It's uh, un under active development. It's taken very good care of the from the people who created it. Uh, Cognitech, and Cognitech was recently acquired by this uh, huge unicorn bank in Brazil, so it's very well funded as well. It has a very engaged community, and Cognitech is taking part in this community. Their community guy, Alex Miller, he's taking full part in, in the community. He leads by example, and he has created, I would say, maybe the most inclusive and welcoming uh, community, uh, programming community that I have seen. I mean, when I, st when I joined, it was, it was all welcoming and people helping me. And yeah, so I'm, I'm so grateful for this. It also have a very str uh, strong open source community, and uh, which I am a part of, so I know what I'm talking about here. It's also funded by the community to some part, it's also funded by dependent businesses in a very interesting model. And also Cognitech has, has uh, taken a strong stance for, for uh, sponsored uh, and funded open source. So they are directing six figure dollars yearly uh, to, uh, to fund and, and support open source. Still no one can live <laughs> as an open source developer here, but it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly very uh, good as an open source development that you can get some, uh, um, some um, money for your work as well. The REPL. I mean, if you have heard of anything about Clojure, you have heard of this REPL. And lots of programming languages have REPLs, of course, but few of them have REPLs like Clojure's. They need to be a Lisp you know, to have it, uh, and what it it is, it's like REPL is uh, the thing that reads the, the closure code and evaluates it, uh, and and then uh, prints it back uh, to you, and then loops back. And all closure code is written like that. So when a closure program is 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 like instantiated in a way. That's the closure reader reading each form one by one and just evaluating the format, the program into existence. So the REPL is actually like living inside your, the, the app you're building. And then also you, you can plug this, 
uh, REPL into the, to the editor. And then you can, through your editor, modify the app as it is running. So uh, you develop things in small building blocks, as I said, often data first, and, and then you, you iterate on it and the program grows like under your fingers. And very seldom you restart. One of the like, biggest closure uh, applications out there, uh, uh, I think it's like the developer there, he has never restarted it. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's uh, quite amazing. And I would say that when you, when you work like this, have your editor, uh, it's like you, you, you bring on the editor as your suit. And then you, pro, you control your program. So maybe this <laughs> metaphor here with Iron Man doesn't hold. Uh, I think like if you can have a metaphor with Iron Man, you should. So here it is. Uh, but anyway, when he is suited up, he gets... Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, he gets one with this machine and can control it. Of course, uh, uh, he, as you saw, it takes... A t if you've seen the movie, it takes a while before he actually gets in control of it. And maybe with closure, it takes a bit longer than he did uh, with that. Uh, a friend of mine actually said that it's also like a potter's uh, wheel. Uh, so you, you can feel with your fingers, like have contact with, with the application as it's as it is created and you, you form it. So yeah, maybe that's... that's uh, the better metaphor of these two. Uh, but uh, I will show you, so maybe that's better than throwing metaphors at you. So let me just say a few words about Calva. So I, I created Calva uh, because I wanted to stay with my favorite editor and there wasn't very good uh, closure support on VS Code then. Uh, so <coughs> then I I, re I re released the first version of uh, Calva uh, three years ago, and uh, it was very quickly picked up. So I think, like, I don't know how many weeks it was. I had 1,000 downloads. And then Linus, uh, my colleague there <laughs> at, at uh, this fintech startup, he threw a, a bit of a party at the office for this like, cake and stuff like that. And then I realized I had a product. And then the product owner in me woke up and, and I, I started to decide that, okay, I should make this uh, to something that is just not like, so, you, so that you can use this code. It should also be that you want to use this code. And so Calvary is very actively developed by me and Brandon Rinch. Uh, and the thing uh, with any editor uh, extension helping with closure is that it must support interactive programming. So it, it is creating these closure documents, if you like, in VS Code, where the REPL is hooked in, and then the, that REPL lives in, in the application. So you, through Calva, you have control uh, <coughs> of the application. And it also has strong support for this structural editing that, in, that is enabled by, by the structural nature of Lisp. And uh, it is a complete uh, development uh, environment. So it has syntax highlighting, formatting, everything like that. Uh, that you, uh, so that is a bit maybe uncommon in the closure world that you have one thing doing all of it, but that's... Uh, that's how Calva is, is built anyway. And unique for Calva uh, so far is, is this getting started REPL. Because we want to, and I want to, enable people to easily use uh, Clojure. Sometimes it take, takes a while to get the tooling together and stuff like that. So you want to you uh, make that easier, and that's what I've tried to do with this uh, getting started REPL. So, there is a page for it here, but the thing with it, it, it looks in, in VS Code as a command, 
fire up the getting started repo. And what it will do, it will open up three files for you. One is to, trying to teach you the basic of, of interactive programming with, with Calva. And the one is trying to teach you about structural editing. And one about closure. The one about closure is not finished yet, but it's, it's there and you can start learning closure that way. Enough talking. You one promised you some live coding. Here it comes. So we see, so in in uh, in VS Code you have the command palette, and you find the fire up this getting started repo. And I will create new files. The three files that I promised opens up. The repl is started. The, the application is is uh, is. Uh, 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 it's now started. You see it here in the output window. Maybe I need to increase it a bit for you. That it prints this hello uh, thing here. That's because that's the last thing that you find in this uh, in this file. So uh, remember, I told you that the, that the closure program is built like the reader is reading each expression one by one. And the final thing it 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 it, uh, it reads uh, that is that is the result of the evaluation. That's what we see here. Uh, and then this file tries to uh, teach you the uh, how, how you you get started with evaluating something because evaluation of uh, expression is the thing. So let me. I think you will see what, what, which keys I, I'm pressing. So here you have a, a function, uh, and it has a, like a documentation string. It takes one argument uh, s, and then it will uh, it will return a concatenation of hello s and bang. Uh, and to get this uh, function to be created, I need to evaluate it. Of course, now I have loaded this file, so it is already. Uh, uh, there, but I press Alt and then Enter, and that will evaluate this form, and it will define uh, this um, greet function in the namespace that we were, were in, and the namespace we are in is hello repl. So it will create a, a var, it's called, which will hold the value which is this fu the function in this case, and it will bind that to this uh, symbol so I can use it in my code. And then to call this function, what you do in, uh, often do as a closure coder is that you, you put comment uh, blocks in, in your file uh, because a comment is, comment is a macro uh, it's defined like this, so it's this is like documentation and some metadata, but here is the actual function, here, where I have the cursor. That's nothing, so it returns nil. Uh, so that means that when the closure reader reads this, it just gets to be nil, and you, as I told you, nil is is fine. Um, and as that is how you do work in Calva. Things in, in this comment block are also, you can also evaluate them with, with the same command, uh, alt enter. So now I evaluated the function call to greet, and it, uh, <coughs> and it uh, greeted us with this. And I can, of course, and evaluate that, and that is. Uh, so the result of calling this function is this string. It's printed here, and it's shown here. And, of course, you can also uh, print stuff that's like a... have this side effect of printing something to stand it out. And you do that with print line, as just as in Scala. And <coughs> then, if I call this, the result is nil. But uh, it's also printed here. 
And of course, sometimes you'd need to evaluate something that's smaller than the whole function uh, you're working with. And so then you have a command for, for evaluating uh, just the current form. So if I have the cursor beside this vector here, and I press control and, and enter, it will evaluate uh, that vector. That's a literal, so it evaluates to itself, of course. I can also uh, evaluate this string the same way. It evaluates it also to itself. I can evaluate this two. It evaluates to itself. And I can also evaluate this symbol, foo, here. Of course, it's hidden in this comment form. So the reader hasn't evaluated that one. So foo doesn't exist yet. So that blows up here. But if I then do alt enter here, I have the fine foo in this namespace. And now if I evaluate foo, it will evaluate to, to, um, um, to the, what is defined as, as this vector. Uh, yes, one more convenience ergonomic evaluation uh, command in Calva is you can evaluate everything up to the cursor in, this in, in the current and closing form. So say I have this uh, data structure. It, uh, it's, a <coughs> it's a board game called, uh, called Express. I can recommend playing it with your family. It's fun. I evaluate that, so now that exists in, the, in this namespace. And then I evaluate this function as well. It takes a collection sequence, a collection, and then it will c calculate the mean on that collection. Let me get that into existence as well. And here I'm using a threading macro, the thread last ma macro. So it will take whatever is here, which is, of course, this uh, data structure that we have defined it as. And, and then it will uh, call the next function with that as an argument, as a last argument. That's the thread last here. So it will be put here. And then the result of that function call will be handed to next function last and put there. And then that will be to the next function, and so on and so on. So this is very common pattern in, in, in Clojure. It's, it's like pipelines uh, uh, transforming uh, uh, data for you. So here, if I use this uh, uh, function, that uh, this command that evaluates up to the cursor, and I use it standing there with the cursor, it will evaluate uh, this um, uh, two cold express. It threads there. If I have the cursor here, it will call the function, this function, on this uh, data structure. This is a keyword. And keywords in, in Clojure are also functions. So when you use them together with, with, a, with a hash map dictionary, if you're from Python, uh, it will call, look itself up in, in, in the map. So it will pick up the, out the ratings here, and that's that, this map, as you see here. And then I, if I do the same thing here, that will call the function vols on this, on this so we get the, the values. <coughs> and then I will, the last thing in this thread is calling this function average with these values. And that is, this is a very fun game, see the high rating. And of course, this is the full uh, ex expression here, uh, so you will be uh, able to also use Alt Enter here to to have the same result as just doing the last one. So those three uh, uh, evaluation commands will take you far. Uh, you you can evaluate the top level thing. That's often a definition of something, and you can evaluate just one one thing with control enter and you can evaluate up to something with control alt enter yes 
And then this file goes on to teach you about trying to get you to, to evaluate and evaluate away. So that's the mood, mood you need to be in when you work with, uh, when you work with Clojure. And I can also show you this. It says, said it's a hosted language. So you can also call very easily call down to, to the host, uh, host platform. So this is calling the Java function uh, math apps. Uh, oh, so if I evaluate this, that, that will happen. And this is also a very common function range that will create, uh, in this case, something, uh, a sequence from 0 to 9. Uh, this sequence will be lazy, it's good to know. It's sometimes it um, has, yeah, you, 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 it, it's not always ergonomic uh, in that case, but it's, it's for a purpose, it's very powerful that you know that you have lazy sequences. Uh, but sometimes it, it, uh, it, uh, it can surprise you. But anyway, so this is what it, it evaluates to. Calvo also has a debugger, uh, which, I, which is really good in, in some situation, of course. But with the REPL connected into the application, very often you don't need, you don't need uh, the, the debugger. So the way I would debug this simple uh, and, and uh, contrived example uh, is, so we have a function here, bar takes one argument n, and then this condition uh, macro, it, it takes a test, uh, expression, test, expression, test, and every, for, when a test is true, that expression will be returned, and then it will short circuit and stop doing anything more. So it, this one will test first if n is uh, bigger than 40, and if so, it will return n plus 20. And otherwise, it will check if it's bigger than 20, and then it will return the result of that. Else, here is a keyword, because, and keywords are truthy. So it's just convention that you should name this else, this, this, uh, this condition. Uh, and then if I call this function, first I need to get it into existence because it's hidden in this comment block. And then I call this function and we see that it hits this else block here, of course. But if I call it with 24, it blows up. So something is wrong here. And then uh, the task here is to find out what's wrong. And what I will do is, would do most often, is that I, I'm, I would want to evaluate this. But I can't, because n is not, it's like local into this function, right? It's not, it doesn't exist in the namespace. Uh, and then I would like to evaluate uh, in, inside this function. But to be able to do that, I often do this. I put a def form in here, and I define the namespace variable n to be the local, get the value of the local variable, value n. And then if I call this function again, it will still blow up, but I will have captured n. So if we look now at n, what? No, I need to first reevaluate this function. Sorry. Now call it. Now look at n. So it has the value 24. Now I can look at this function. So I can, oh, that's false. That means this will not happen. I put the cursor there. Oh, that's true. That means this will happen. So what happens if I Evaluate this. Okay, we have we are targeting in here on the pro on the problem, which is of course here that I'm calling first, which is one of these sequence abstraction functions, on an integer, and that doesn't work. So we have found the problem. So very often with uh, closure, you use the REPL like this, and the fact that it is in 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 uh, you can modify the the application. So data is immutable, the application is immutable. That's the, the, the way it's wired up. Yeah, and this one also shows you some, some of this structural editing. Uh, 
it it stops you from deleting the structure because if I, if I delete this uh, uh, closing paren here then the structure will be broken the center cannot hold uh, so everything is is uh, uh, out of everything no all bets off if I if I delete that so Calva will will uh, help you not do it so it will just move the cursor now this of course I can delete and if I delete so this is how uh, what what th this uh, thing in in this uh, getting started app will try try to teach you and I can also show you a bit more this structural thing makes makes me I can I can with uh, some uh, keyboard shortcuts I can modify uh, the structure very easily and then if I then evaluate this and we can run it and that's that's what that function does so I said we we won't go in here and learn more about structural editing if you get curious about this I really recommend you to do it uh, but we will look a bit here this closure guide because it's it's rather big it's so far almost 2500 lines uh, which is a lot in closure and we, okay, of course most of it is is comments that's how the guide is is uh, is written it's by far not finished but it's enough there for you to start learn closure so you, what you should start with and any, any file you open in closure especially with calva it needs you need to let the REPL have it and evaluate it otherwise like nothing really works so there's a one shortcut for that now you see this message here which I have put down here that's the last thing in this file now it's loaded now it's fine here you see maybe the shortest hello world program in any programming language this is the full hello world program uh, and uh, no parents <laughs> if you're uh, scared of parents you see the hello world doesn't have them of course this is jokingly but very common thing when you if you, if you think about the java hello world it has a lot of boilerplate around it uh, so very little boilerplate in, in closure very often uh, the solutions are are small and very maintainable and uh, again we try to encourage experimentation here everything in closure is an expression uh, so this function here it has four expressions and the last expression that is evaluated by this function is the one that gets the result of this expression there are no return statements because there are no statements in closure only expressions so if I define this function no, like that and uh, if I would call it it would f first uh, evaluate this which prints this and then it will evaluate this it returns one then it will evaluate that and then it will evaluate that so let's see if I'm, I'm correct here did I I evaluated it right yeah great then if I call it that is actually what happened side effect one side effect two and then two what happened with one it disappeared it could have found the next uh, unknown prime number all for naught because it's evaluated there never used it just disappears only this two will exist after like because it's returned as the result and yeah so how much time do I have four minutes uh, oh that's little yeah I would want more because I w would want to show uh, a bit of uh, how application development is do it. done I can switch to that instead and yeah. instead of showing more of this uh, 
so here I have an application and um, let me here it is this application is built with uh, closure script shadow sale yes which is compiling a closure script and also doing hot reloading and it's hot reloading deluxe I would say so it's uh, it will keep the state of the app as the as the application is is modified by me by my editor so for instance if I would uh, uh, okay I can show you that it is actually the editor here is connected to this application by evaluating this uh, function. So that happens inside the app. And I can then, let's say I change the background color here. And then let's save this file. You see, you see that, oh, okay. This is, I need to, no, that was the wrong. I need to disable the built-in fast refresh because that doesn't really work for this. So let me make, give us some state here. Now we have uh, clicked six times here and we, put it back to white here, and I save the file. Uh, the background color here will, will, will show that we have modified the app. The state is still there. Six, uh, the six is still there. Imagine that it's much more complicated state. You need to uh, click through the application and, uh, and um, enter data everywhere and stuff to get to that state, and you want to fix a bug there, or just fix how it looks. Uh, then, this is super, super powerful. Uh, so let's see here. Yeah, I can modify this a bit more. Uh, you don't really click things in an, in an application like that. We look, let's look at this, uh, what we have here. This is uh, a, d a data structure, vectors that you know, declaratively um, defines this screen here. So it has a React Native view and then a React Native text, which has this uh, tapped encounter. And it has a button, which has um, an, something happens when you press it. And uh, it has a text, click me, let's say it says, tap me, like that. and. Uh, it has an image and stuff like that. So that's how this, uh, that's the structure of this one. The, it starts with uh, uh, defining uh, two variables. Uh, so this counter, which is the result of this subscription. I'm using reframe uh, in this application, which is a, it's a framework for handling state in, uh, in, your, in your application. It's very similar to Redux. And these, both of these are like model from, from, uh, from Elm, uh, how Elm ha handles this. I don't remember what, what, um, what it's called in Elm. If you do, then uh, type it in the chat. So here uh, it's subscribing uh, to this uh, subscription. So if I evaluate this, it will actually uh, give me what's, what's in this counter. So if I tap this some more and then evaluate this again, that's actually what's, what, what, what's in the state. And also in the state here, we have the value of this subscription, subscription and I can evaluate that's true. That's why we can tap this because here we set the disable uh, from that variable. But we can dispatch here with, with reframe, and I will dispatch this event, which sets, which sets this to false. And you see the button there turns uh, disabled. I can't click it. I can also do what, what happens when I press, 
press this button, I can dispatch this myself. Um, like that. So even though I can't uh, press the button now, I can, I can, um, let's re-enable it. So what happens when I dispatch this then? This application is built uh, using this top-down uh, thing I told you. It's like, at the, at the bottom, it, it's just a data structure. This is the data uh, in this. So it has a counter, it starts with zero, and it's, uh, the, this, uh, if it's happened or not, is true, and it also has two um, uh, Fibonacci numbers there, uh, hinting a bit of what I would like to do if I have the time to show it. Uh, so, I'm going to tell me to, to go on. Uh, right, so, let's say, uh, then, okay, so that's, uh, the, that, that's the database. The event that I'm dispatching is defined here, and it's, uh, it's, uh, these events are taking the database as the input, and then they will do something and return a new database. That's how, how the application state is, is updated. And uh, this ink counter, it updates the database, the key counter in the database, that key, and it will call the function ink on it, which just increment it to one. If I would redefine this function to uh, do more inks and redefine it. And now if I tap this button, it will count by threes instead. And uh, then the subscriptions are also functions that take the database and some argument, and then they will return something calculated from that database. Uh, so what we could do if we wanted to do Fibonacci numbers here instead is that we could have this, uh, look at this data structure, which is now the last two, and think about what we would want to do to, uh, to get the next uh, uh, Fibonacci number in the sequence. And then we could define an event that looks like this. Leg event db. And let's say uh, we call it advance. No. Advance fib. And we see that it's a function which takes the db, and like the encounter, we don't care about the arguments we get. And then what we do here is uh, that we that we will um, uh, let's see here. we will update the db. Update takes a um, data structure, and it takes something, a uh, key in this data structure. So what was called in the database? It was called last fibs, right? Uh, so we take last fibs and update that, and we apply a function on it. So we define that function here. And this function gets like the two last Fibonacci numbers. So I will destructure them from here, fib1 and fib2. And then I will return a new vector, that is fib2, and then the sum of fib1 and fib2. So this, this um, event will... Uh, uh, hopefully update the database with, with uh, uh, the next Fibonacci pair. And then we need a subscription. Uh, so I will 
sub and we can call it uh, current fib why not and it's a function it takes a database and gets another argument that we don't care about right now and we will then uh, uh, just call we will we can use a thread uh, here and we take the database and uh, we take the what was it called current fibs last fibs last fibs from that database uh, and then we return the first thing in that so if we define this now in our application if we if we um, for the counter instead call the subscription we just made with current fib I think this one should return one now because that's what we have there right and if we make the button here dispatch uh, advance fib instead uh, save this uh, now one is the current thing so now in theory if I click this button it should give me the next no it didn't blow up uh, uh, is null so I don't really know why this uh, blew up DB in update it with so this one is defined, right? This one is defined. The current fib. And save there. Reload the app. And I tapped here, right? And then it crashed on us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I think uh, I failed at this <laughs> uh, at this uh, demo. I don't really don't understand why. So, advanced fib. It's there, and I dispatch that there. So. If I violate that, it blows up. Yeah. Oh, actually, I don't uh, understand. I think the time is running out for us. Uh, maybe I will come back and do some more successful uh, live coding uh, for you. Thank you very much anyway, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> I think it was very brave of you to do like live coding. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Maybe too brave. But no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> hmm? I mean, this is the proof you don't have to succeed <laughs> 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 to do live coding. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you could rehearse it. <laughs> But I guess you're going to come up with a solution. You know what we do? We put the solution under, we're going to, I mean, we make, um, we cut this into three, like your piece into one film. Yeah. We'll put the solution under your film or a link to it. Yeah, great. And then you can yeah. show it. I will show. Hmm? Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah. You said you went religious when you met or when you started working with Closure. What did you work before? Everyone wants to know. So I was a 
um, immediately before I was a product owner on this uh, fintech mm -hmm. startup, so I wasn't going well. And before that, I was a product owner at another uh, company. So for a long time, I hadn't been coding yeah. uh, uh, at all. Uh, Interesting. So you were like more like a product owner, and then you yeah. find closure and went back to coding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's why I said it. It, uh, it uh, show, changed my show closure to product owners. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> could be dangerous. <laughs> could be dangerous. <laughs> they start coding. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any more questions? Yeah. Oh, I uh, didn't get any. Yes. Um, how come you call it Calva? Any special reason? Yeah, so that's um, that's um, um, the the most used uh, editor uh, extensions for Emacs, and it's called Cider. Mm, yes. So, and if you know anything about you do how you make mm. Calvados, it's that you distill it from from Cider. So, and and Calva uses a lot of the Cider infrastructure. Yep. So it's distilled from Cider. Yes. We got one comment from a guy. Uh, return. You can read it yourself if you can see it. Return. Uh, oh, sorry. Return parenthesis instead of. Maybe we solve it this now in the live code. It. My God. Let's see. This is more like mob pro programming now. Yeah. Yes. Or uh, meetup programming. Understand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was the thing. My God, we solved it. The community solved it for you. Yeah. The, the power of the community. Yeah. Thank you, whoever it was. Yes. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Let's see that it actually works then. Yeah, do it. Yeah. Uh, so then if uh, we bring back. Our let's see, can we run it? Here. Yeah. Tap it. And then, oh, sorry, I should say there. Yeah. And tap here. No. Yeah. It's sorry. It's, it's uh this is uh, React Native uh, playing tricks on me. Now, if I tap this, we still don't. Hmm. Still one more issue to solve. One bug, one bug down. Twenty more to go. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, actually, now we can dispatch it <laughs> without errors. Yeah. So this might be just a, a matter of. Uh, Yes, I had one more comment actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, your daughter. No, no, no. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, your daughter said hello in the chat also. Oh, thank you. Yes. Which, which one of them? Uh, good question. Don't know. Roxbox. Don't know. Maybe they already hacked your phone. <laughs> yeah, maybe they did. <laughs> mm, hope the bank <laughs> account is protected. Um, thank you very much again. Thank Peter. you. Thank you. Yes.